Hi everybody, this is Katie Palacios, an instructional designer here at San Diego Mesa College. I'm joined by two of my colleagues here today with me. I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Kimberly Locker and I teach English here at Mesa College. And I'm Brianna Kuhn and I also teach English here at Mesa College. So today we're excited to present to you, <clears throat> our online audience, from weeding out to reaching out, connecting with our students who need it most. This was actually a presentation that Brianna Kim and I presented to the online teaching conference uh, last month in June 2018. And so we thought we would record it so that we have the opportunity to share it with all of you who couldn't make it to the conference. So here we go. Okay, so the objective of today's session is really to be able to apply equitable course design ideas tools and resources to your own online course design. That's what we're hoping that you get out of this presentation today. As we go through our presentation today, we'll be sharing several quotes from Zaretta Hammond's book, Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain, Promoting Authentic Engagement and Rigor Among Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Students. So here you see this quote, being responsive to diverse students' needs, asks teachers to be mindful and present. That requires reflection. So you can never take yourself out of the equation. Instead, you have to commit to the journey. So this is a journey. It's not something that you're just going to be able to flip the switch on your course today. Um, this is um, a reflective journey. And so we've provided a PDF handout that you can use as a tool to begin that journey. And you'll find the link to that um, along with this video. But it's um, hopefully something that, you'll, that will guide you through the reflection process and you'll find links on the um, uh, handout to the, this slide deck as well um, and to her Ready for Rigor framework. So that's really what we've built a lot of this presentation on. Um, also included, um, of course, the course design rubric from the OEI. So the California Community Colleges have the OEI course design rubric, which really helps to um, ready courses that are going to be delivered on the exchange. But in our case at San Diego Mesa College, it's a really nice framework for individual faculty members to use to self-assess their own courses. And here are the areas of the rubric that we'll be touching on through our presentation today. So the title of the presentation is From Weeding Out to Reaching Out. So um, together we kind of talked about it and decided, you know, in terms of the, the term weeding out, what does that mean? And it's really when the instructor acts as a gatekeeper, um, telling students that they either can hack it or they can't. And so we decided to create a presentation that focuses on reaching out instead. Yeah, so reaching out to us assumes that all students are capable with intentional support and partnership, and that students bring with them valuable experiences and skills. It also means to show authentic care and genuine interest in them as human beings. And we're really talking today about how to be teachers that make students feel seen, heard, and cared for as a learner. And that's how Zaretta Hammond states it in her book as well, The Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain book. Um, I've mentioned the book already a couple times, but this book really is an awesome resource for teachers who are on this journey of equitable um, course design and teaching. Uh, this book has really been our research anchor for our presentation and we highly recommend that you read this book. While it's not specifically for online courses, it can be applied to the online setting and uh, the digital tools that we're using as online faculty. So we're talking about underserved English learners, poor students, and students of color that routinely receive less instruction in higher order skills development than other students. Those are the same students that Zaretta Hammond is referring to, to in her book. And they're the students that we're talking about today that we hope to reach out to through the methods we present in this presentation. Um, in her Ready for Rigor framework, Hammond shares how teachers can set the stage for transforming dependent learners to independent learners in four key practice areas of culturally responsive teaching. So she, she talks about awareness, knowing our own cultural contexts, biases, triggers, etc. Learning partnerships, so building supportive, caring uh, relationships with our students. Information processing, so that's really how the learning is 
processed, how the learning is happening inside of our brains. And then community of learners and learning environment. That's really the, um, the community that we're building in the online course through the um, interface as well as the uh, activities that we're providing to our students. So her book is written for classroom teachers, but today we're hoping to share how we can use those same strategies in our online teaching. So what, one technique that we decided to do was to give our students a short survey in order to kind of gauge what they need from online classes, why they're there, etc. So we're starting with the student voice. And so the next three slides kind of show a wordle of the responses that we received for each question. So this first question is, why are you taking this class online? And so a key, you know, the bigger words on the wordle are the ones that are repeated responses. So of course, work, schedule, convenience were some of the most prominent uh, responses there. And then what keeps you engaged and motivated to continue in the online course? Uh, the assignments, the professor you notice is bigger, um, motivated, online, you know, these uh, engaged, right? So these kinds of words really tell us, the instructor, uh, how to reach our students most effectively. And then they also gave us some suggestions for improving. So they want feedback, um, they want suggestions, some videos. Uh, some of the most effective things that we've uh, come to understand is using video to provide feedback and instruction. Um, so again, these three questions really helped us as online instructors understand what our students need from us. Continuing with the importance of including the student voice, we'd like to share with you a two-minute video snippet from At One's Digital Learning Day. During this video, Daniel Contreras, a student from Solano Community College, shares how one of his online instructors reached out to him and the impact that had on Daniel. As I started to fall behind um, and trying to balance um, like student government and everything together, uh, something really stood out. Um, this particular professor I had, um, it, was a, it was a critical thinking uh, class for um, writing, it was uh, 004. Um, and he just, he noticed that I hadn't logged in, I think, uh, for the week or something, and just, he just checked in. And it sort of surprised me because I hadn't really been reached out to by a professor in that way, even in an actual um, classroom, you know, um, a physical classroom. And so that sort of just like stood out to me and I said, oh, wow, you know, someone's like paying attention. Um, and on an online class, I mean, that was just an odd kind of feeling uh, just to say, you know, this was beginning to feel more engaging and more, um, uh, I guess, direct uh, than even a physical class was. Um, and as it continued, I, and I continued to struggle, and I would kind of bounce back and forth, um, he really, this professor just began to just really blow my mind with his level of concern, um, how he, he would reach out regularly, um, check in with me, um, and he did a couple things where he even offered to give me some time management, um, coaching, you know, um, pull me off to the side. Um, and I was just, I had never met such um, a professor that had such a, I, I call it like a culture of like completion and caring. It's like this guy wanted me to finish this class and do well. And um, he was showing it with so much energy and so much um, like passion just through Canvas, you know? So thank you to Daniel for sharing your story with us and to At One for providing a stage for students' voices like Daniel's and for faculty to share effective online teaching strategies with each other. Let's jump into some of our reaching out strategies now. So when it comes to welcoming students, how about this for a weeding out strategy? Welcome to this class. My info is in the syllabus, professor, and then followed by a whole list of acronyms from licenses and degrees that I've earned. Right, so that contrasted with. So there's a number of different ways that you can not only make your online class more aesthetically interesting, but including the most important information and making it really accessible to students. So I use this tool from Adobe Spark, um, which is free and it's really user friendly. And you guys can go to spark 
www.adobe.com um, and it, it, it'll walk you through and you can create videos and posts like this one um, to give students um, the most important information such as the CRN, your name, where you're located, um, your office hours of course, your email, so that when they log into your class it's all right there for them and they don't have to search for it. I think you guys mentioned before about how you've used welcome videos to kind of provide that welcome as well. That's another thing, right, that here what we're going for and what she talks about in the book is really beginning to build trust because that's at the core of these positive relationships. So look for ways to allow the students to get to know you so that they can begin to trust you. So one way that students will get to know you right away is the first week of class in your syllabus. So here we have on the left my old version of my syllabus and then on the right we have the new version of the same syllabus for the same course. And right away aesthetically of course you can see the difference but more importantly I think and we'll, we'll touch on this in a minute is the language that's used in the syllabus here. Um, but even right away if I was a student I'd be much more interested in taking the class on the right than the left. I can tell the care that my instructor has put into the syllabus. And there's a number of different tools to make your syllabus more interesting and then make it prettier, but um, I've honestly just used Word. And it's, you can use PictoChart, which is a, a tool that's, that's free and easy to use, but um, Word is, also has a number of different ways to make your syllabus more, more fun and interesting. And we'll share some of those resources at the end. At One um, has also been collecting some great syllabus design, equitable syllabus design resources for us. So we'll be sure to share those with you at the end as well. Here's something that I often see um, used in online classes, a statement, you need to be an independent and self-directed learner to be successful in this online class. And I often think about what about our students who come to us who are not independent and are not self-directed? They haven't been given the opportunity to develop those skills yet. And are they now ineligible to join our class? Are they destined for failure? What, what message are we sending to our dependent learners by including a statement like this? Contrast that with something like this. So this is uh, just one small passage from my syllabus here. I say, we are responsible for your success in this course. I am your ally. Our class is meant to be a collaborative learning environment in which students and instructor work as a team. So here, um, I've used first person collective pronouns such as we, uh, so that it creates this kind of idea of a partnership. And I talk directly to my students in the syllabus instead of using distancing language like students should be able to do this. Um, and it invites your students in a partnership with you and demonstrates authentic care. Um, it tells students that you don't expect them to succeed 100% on their own and that your job is to support them in any way you need to. When we connect this back to the book, one of the things that she um, talks about over and over is the idea of trust. And it's really, it's when students trust the teacher, that's when they're really willing to take risks in the learning process. And as we know, that's what leads to growth. That idea that you don't just care, but you authentically care about who they are and about their success in the class. So when student and teacher come together as a team to, um, on page 75, she says, tackle specific learning challenges, that's when students can really grow. All right, how many of you out there have shared your teaching philosophy with your students? Crickets, we didn't hear from you. So I have, and uh, this is the, the, my teaching philosophy that I include on my syllabus here. So I'll just read the bolded language. Uh, the main purpose of teaching for me is to hear as many student voices as possible. I work to foster a safe and welcoming learning environment. To me, this is how I continue to grow as an instructor. And it is my strong belief that encountering otherness broadens our scope of the world. Kim, I'll let you go. Oh, sure. Uh, I have to be honest, the, the first time that I included my philosophy in my syllabus, it felt kind of weird and kind of touchy-feely. Um, so I, I don't know that I liked it at first, but I decided to take a chance and include it. And my blurb is the second. Um, when I tell them that I want them to know I care about teaching, I care about my students, I'm here to support them. 
um, we're partners in this process, and that I know that writing is a process, so I hope that, that they will be brave and embrace struggle and what it means to feel uncomfortable. Um, what I have found is that students seem to really like when I'm being vulnerable, um, including something that is this honest and open, and um, I think it's really helped to develop a, a better, more trusting relationship with my students. Here we're talking about too, and both Brianna and Kim mentioned it, taking that emotional risk, because that's what students are gonna be doing, a lot of them, in this learning process, and so doing that alongside with them through sharing this teaching philosophy can have such a great effect on really building that, that learning partnership with them. So as you get started um, in your online class, think about what you have your students do just that very first week. Here's commonly, um, read the syllabus, then watch the tutorial videos, and then take the check-in quiz. But I'm wondering in those, in that sequence of events, where are we getting to learn about who our student is? Yeah, so we think that it's a good idea that before we begin, um, we take a survey of the students in the course, and we want to know more about them. So have you taken an online class before? How might, uh, how might we impact your success this semester? How are you feeling about this online class? And these kinds of questions really promote authentic care because we are finding out where our students are coming from. We truly care about what obstacles they may have and want to help them overcome these obstacles. And it's different from an icebreaker uh, because an icebreaker is public, whereas the survey that, that we would do here is uh, private. And it gives them another space to share one-on-one -on -one and open the lines of communication early on in the semester. And if students do open up early, we can provide that intentional support immediately in the first week. Yeah, this is really that listening. If you don't think you can listen in an online class, you certainly can. And it's a matter of intentionally building those tools in. So here's an example of listening to the needs of our students, being aware of what they need and demonstrating that we care about it. Here's a question for you. What opportunities do you provide for student agency and student voice in your online course. A statement like this, please do not post more than twice to the online discussions. That statement controls student voice, limits the opportunities they have to express themselves and be themselves online. Kim, tell us how you're allowing student voice and agency in your online course. So another blurb that I include in my syllabus, and I talk about this um, in my welcome video to my students as well, is that um, their opinions and life experiences are valued, and I want them to feel confident in sharing their views in this class. And of course, I don't limit the number of responses for our online discussions. Um, I think it's also really important to use culturally relevant texts that reflect their experiences, um, what they're going through, so that they feel more connected to the content. Because again, if they feel more connected to it and they feel more connected to you, that's where the authentic growth is gonna happen. Yeah, and one more thing here. I think it's important not to limit, like we've been saying, not to limit the discussion posts. And you could even encourage your students to loop back to their original post to see what comments they got and then continue that conversation. Just another um, technique to allow them to grow. What opportunities do you give students beyond just receiving content from you in the online course? So it may sound extreme, but unfortunately online courses are sometimes just a series of PowerPoint files and corresponding quizzes. So read the chapter one PowerPoint slides and take the chapter one quiz. Read the chapter two PowerPoint slides and take the chapter two quiz. Does this sound familiar? You know, some professors will live and die by their PowerPoints, and I will admit I do use PowerPoint occasionally. However, uh, what the weeding out technique kind of implies here is that that is the extent of the content delivery, is just the PowerPoint. And these courses become more of independent study where students have to teach themselves and the instructor is more like a robot and the quizzes are graded automatically, which means there's no personalized feedback. Uh, they take the set it and forget it approach and you know, kind of don't make the course content more dynamic. So some ways to reach out to students um, would be collaboration. There are a number of ways that students can use peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Even though it's an online course, they can still connect with each other. They can work on projects together. Of course, the discussion board 
Um, another tool is metacognitive reflection, getting students to think about their learning process. So for example, in my online writing course, students write essays, but then I have them reflect on their writing process so that they can see the growth that they are making as writers. Also checking in with students, um, that muddiest point, finding out how they're doing, taking a temperature of the course and just seeing, you know, what are you struggling with? Or what are you proud of in this class so far? What are you doing well? And what do you need more help with? In the book, Zaretta Hammond talks about how when we structure our lessons around this framework of ignite, chunk, chew, and review, it helps our learners to actually grow their intellective capacity. So ignite, we're you know, getting them excited about the topic. Chunk, we're chucking it out in a way that is manageable for them. We're giving them time and activities that allow them to chew through it, which is not just staring at PowerPoint slides and taking quizzes. And then also giving them an opportunity after the, that initial delivery to go back and review it, to reflect on it, and to kind of help to stimulate um, that intellective growth. So she does a really great job in the book of sharing the importance of that, each one of those elements of um, that process. So one important aspect of uh, teaching a reaching out course is checking in. So an example of a weeding out strategy is to say if you do not submit the required assignments for two consecutive weeks, you are considered inactive and will be dropped. And so here we're basically just saying if you don't do this, if you don't do this, we are going to drop you. You will not be successful. You will fail. So while it's important to have a drop policy in our syllabus, that is really important. And we do need to clearly define the active participation requirements for our class so they're clear for our students. Those need to be coupled with checking in with students who do go inactive. So think back here to the Daniel Contreras clip where he mentions the impact that his instructors checking in had on him. This is something that I started doing in my own online courses when my students missed the Sunday deadline rather than just saying oh they're now inactive and now I'll kind of like you know keep them on my radar but probably fail them or drop them. Um, now I reach out to them on early in the week probably Monday and I'll send a, just a very simple message to all my students who didn't submit and say something like this is everything okay? It kind of opens the door to allow them to explain what happened. It shows them that I care about what's going on. And this is actually the way, by sending that very simple message to one of my students a couple semesters ago, that's how I found out that I had a student who had lost her housing situation and was now living in her car trying to find Wi-Fi um, just however she could. So it's amazing what you'll find out. Again, this is that listening strategy online um, and how providing those opportunities for our students is what's going to let us give them what they need to be successful in the course. And one quick way that we can check in is uh, when we do move to Canvas, um, there is a tool in the Grade Center where you can click on a, a assignment column and a drop down menu comes down and it says message students who with an ellipsis and you can message all the students who haven't submitted or who scored less than and then you type in the score and this is an, a really easy way to send a quick message to all your students and they really can see that you care. Yeah this is that showing concern and building that learning partnership again as we'd seen several times from that from the book. Okay, so the importance of feedback, really a weeding out strategy is that there is no feedback and no opportunity for students to learn from the teacher's feedback um, and no interaction with students to support their improvement. And on the contrary, a reaching out strategy will be to say something like, I will be giving you constructive feedback on your assignment that you can use to revise. You may resubmit your revised work for an improved grade. And so I am someone who strongly believes in revision as a writing instructor, but even if you, you know, don't want to have unlimited revision, at least explain in your policies the rationale behind that. But um, it's really important to, to tell your students up front that you will be there to give constructive feedback so they know how to improve. And in the book, Zaretta Hammond reminds us that feedback helps us literally change our minds. So when students use feedback to improve performance, the brain releases dopamine, which motivates the student to apply more effort and stick with it. So that's on page 101 and 102 of the book, but it's a real 
physiological effect then that feedback has and how important that is in learning. And I'll just add one more quick thing for this uh, feedback portion. Again, once we move to Canvas, there is a way to record video feedback for your students. And this is especially helpful for those who are really struggling because they can now hear your tone, see your face, your gestures, um, and you can embed it straight into Canvas without having to use an external video software. Here's where we hope you take the time to do a reflection. The reflection activity actually takes you through each of those um, slide kind of headings that we just went through. And so we hope you take the time to reflect on your current practice and where maybe you have a growth opportunity for each of those. And in our um, online teaching conference session, we actually had a think pair share here where we had folks introduce themselves to each other. If you're watching this with a peer, feel free to do that with your peer now. Now would be a good time to do that. Um, if we have you accessing this through a Canvas module, then that could be something that you reflect with a colleague asynchronously. You could certainly share your reflection with um, a colleague on your own. This video is part of our Onlineology project at Mesa College, so you'll find more information about Onlineology at this address, bit.ly forward slash Onlineology. We hope this has been useful to you. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch our presentation. Thank you all so much.